Good morning. Good morning each. Good morning all. It is good to be here with you. This is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it and we get to do so together in this time of worship. So welcome whether you're here in person or worshiping with us via the live stream. It's good to see you all, to be here with you. I wanted to make an announcement that it's going to be made multiple times and in different ways to say that next week Sunday we have a joint worship service once again with the Christian Agape Church. That worship service will begin at 10.30 a.m. Very good class. 10.30 a.m. Uh, we'll keep saying that. And there'll be more uh, words of announcement about that. Time of worship together. Time of eating together. Should be a really lovely morning, but we do want you to know that it's going to start at 10.30, not at 9.30. Today, uh, we're going to begin um, a kind of a, I guess, a prequel to what's going to be, I think, an, a longer running series on the parables of Jesus, especially from the Gospel of Matthew. And today is, um, I think, kind of a, a fun and interesting one because it's a parable of Jesus teaching about teaching. He's helping us learn how to be good learners, how to receive what he is, is giving in the parable of the sower and the seed and the soils. So we'll come to that uh, presently. But we're gathered here in Jesus' name and in his presence it's going to be God's word that calls us to worship together this morning. I'll invite Erica to come forward. I invite you to rise as able and join where indicated in these words from Hebrews chapter 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But now he has spoken to us by his son. God appointed his son heir of all things. Through his Son, he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. He sustains all things by his powerful word. Praise God for the gift of the Son. We welcome the light of the world. Dear friends, it is the light of the world, God's own Son, who greets and welcomes us this morning. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the abundant fellowship of the Holy Spirit all be yours. Amen and amen. Come, let's worship God together in song. Yeah. 
Hear the psalmist's testimony. The heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day, they pour forth speech. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The precepts of the Lord are right giving joy to the heart. We are called to know God through his creation and through his word, but we pray now in confession, acknowledging our need for God's revelation to guide and correct our sinful ways. Let us pray. The skies are proclaiming your glory, Lord, and revealing knowledge of your power. Your word is trustworthy and true, reliable and enduring. By your word, search and know us, O God. Your guidance is more precious than gold and sweeter than honey. Through your word and by your spirit on this day.
May these words of our mouths and this meditation of our hearts Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear this good news of God's revelation through his Son, a revelation that also purifies us from all our sin. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, the one who is heir of all things, through whom God made the universe, the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God's being, sustaining all things by his powerful word, the Son, provided purification for sins, and then sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Thanks be to God. Amen. We respond by professing together what the church confesses is true of God's word revealed in scripture through the words of the Belgic Confession. We know God by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe. The universe is before our eyes like a beautiful book in which all creatures, great and small, are as letters to make us ponder God's eternal power and divinity. We confess that God, with special care for us and our salvation, commanded his servants, the prophets and apostles, to commit his revealed word to writing. We believe without a doubt what they teach, because the Holy Spirit testifies in our hearts that they are from God. We believe that this Holy Scripture contains the will of God completely and that everything one must believe to be saved is sufficiently taught in it.
morning. This morning our offerings are for Roosevelt Park Ministries and the ministry here at Shawnee Park Christian Reformed Church. Roosevelt Park Ministries is a Christian development organization that primarily serves recent Hispanic immigrants. This ministry builds community by providing individual citizenship services, tax services, and family and individual counseling services. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning to pray for Roosevelt Park Ministries. Please, Lord, bless these gifts and guide the staff and volunteers as they faithfully serve the Hispanic community through citizenship and family individual counseling services. We also pray this morning for the various ministries of Shawnee Park. Lord, we know that you are the great provider of these gifts each week. Please bless these gifts. As we progress through the church year, we pray that these gifts will be used to further your kingdom, both globally and in our neighborhood, as well as build community among us. We know, Lord, that through your will and your grace, all things are possible. For Jesus' sake, amen. We're going to continue in prayer in just a moment, but first a couple of words of announcements. First, LaVon. There she is. She wasn't down there. She was around here somewhere. Uh, Vaughn heads up our education and discipleship committee. She has a couple announcements about our adult education. Good morning. So last year, as many of you may know, um, Professor Dr. Ralph Sturley did a series on faith and science for our college students. And while he was doing this series, I had a lot of people come up to me and say, well, that sounds awesome. How come he's not doing it for the rest of us? So good news! This year, he is going to actually, under some duress, <laughs> uh, lead us through a series of adult education times on faith and science. The plan is for it to be about six weeks. We're getting started late due to snow and illness. Um, we are planning to record these sessions. They kind of will build over the series. Um, so if you miss one, we will have it recorded and we'll give you more information about where you can listen to it in the SFB. One note that he would like us to make, for the college students particularly, if you were participating last year, today's session, he says, is gonna be about half material that you had last year, but it'll be about half new material. So if you enjoyed it and wanna come back, you are more than welcome to join us. Thank you. Thanks, LaVon. Um, and then I want to say a couple words uh, again about next week, Sunday. Uh, our joint worship service with the Christian Agape Church will begin at 10.30 in the morning. A um, couple notes. I met with Pastor Siyama, um, their pastor, this week. We talked through a few things. The theme of the service is going to be uh, kind of drawn from Revelation 7, where it talks about every nation, tribe, and tongue gathered in worship. Um, they, uh, as a congregation, they are representative of not just one culture, uh, Burmese or Myanmar, but of many subcultures. Uh, some of you are aware of that, Karen and Karani and Kaya and Miso and others. Um, he's going to encourage their folks to wear some of their cultural dress, um, various things to represent their cultures. Now, some of us don't really know what that would be for us. I mean, a, a sweater and slacks, you know, it isn't exactly like... Uh, but if you have something, uh, either a culture you're connected to or a place you visited or something like that, um, that you, would give you a, a story to tell and something to share, please, by all means, um, feel free to join in with that. And then come also with your questions. As we sit down to lunch, you may want to ask some questions about a particular um, kind of dress and why one is different from the other, whether it's the color, the pattern, the texture. It'll be a chance to uh, spark some conversation there. Um, we intend to share communion together. Um, we're letting Christian Agape Church kind of take the lead. We're following their practices uh, around communion, but come ready to receive that together. Uh, we'll have a brief informational meeting after the worship service about the plans for this preschool that we're um, intending and planning and working towards uh, welcoming into our building here in the next year. 
and then we'll go downstairs and share a potluck lunch together. So I think that's um, enough for announcements for now. Other things will be in the SFB email throughout the week, but wanted you to have some of those details um, in front of you today already. Let's then go to God together and join our hearts in prayer for the needs of the church and the world. Oh God, we have sung amazing grace and how genuinely amazing your grace towards us truly is. How sweet the sound of grace in the ears of wretched sinners like us. How wondrous it is to recall the story of our redemption, of the Christ who came and got in line with sinners for baptism, who reached out and touched lepers and even touched the dead, who showed dignity and respect to persons so often treated with contempt, who fed the hungry and washed dirty feet, who resisted the devil and commanded evil spirits who cowered in his presence, who spoke and taught in ways that amazed people, who commanded wind and waves and they obeyed, we thank you for the ways all that he did and said were remembered and retold and recorded and spread through all the world, throughout all the world and down through history and come to us today. All of this to save wretched folks like us who so need every drop and every crumb of grace. We need your grace to know who we are before you and to know whose we are to have an identity and a purpose in this life that are not achieved, but rather received. To know that we are your beloved sons and daughters, recipients of gracious love, created and redeemed and baptized to live and love in the image of Christ. For all this and more, we praise and thank you together this day. We've sung our praise. We thank you for fellow singers around us, we thank you for the ways our voices lifted in song become a harmonious chorus of praise. We thank you for skilled musicians and singers who week after week come to guide and make beautiful our time of worship together. We thank you for the grace of the gifts you've given them and for the grace by which they generously make it an offering to both you and us. We pray, O oh God, that we would not be merely recipients of your grace and your gifts, but also instruments of them. Make us good receivers, but also make us generous givers who know the joy of sharing and multiplying what you have given to us. And so make us eager to show to classmates and friends and neighbors and strangers and even enemies the gracious hospitality you have given to us. Make us attentive to the lonely, welcoming of the foreigner, eager to provide shelter for the vulnerable, justice for the oppressed, and companionship to the lonely. Speak by your spirit and bring to mind, even now, in this moment, bring to our minds those to whom this week we might extend an invitation or write a note or bring a meal or meet for coffee or provide some word or act of kindness that might embody and proclaim the good news of Jesus. Bring them to our mind, O oh God, but then also help us to respond to the promptings you place on our hearts. Almighty Father, the scriptures tell us that by bearing one another's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. We do that in more ways than just prayer, but we do so often begin and end in prayer and bearing one another's burdens. So we pray for those within our congregation with weighty needs at present. We continue our prayers for Carol, and for Dee, and for Len, and for Craig. We pray also for those who are dealing with trouble in their household or strife. We pray for those who are overwhelmed by life's demands or who are facing weighty and difficult decisions. We pray for those who cannot make financial ends meet despite working so hard to do so. We pray for those who are dealing with crises and long struggles with mental health. We thank you in all these cases for those who provide care and encouragement and a listening ear and assistance. And we ask you to empower them and empower us to do your gracious healing, restoring work in the world. We pray for peace throughout your world. 
We pray that your kingdom would come and your wills would be done, not only among us, but beyond us, in our nation, in our world, in our city, in our state, in our neighborhoods, in our homes. May your kingdom come and may your will be done in the work of the world's leaders. May those who have great power and great authority exercise it with due humility and wisdom and competence and care. Oh God, we thank you that Jesus taught us to pray for all these things and more, for all that we have need of in body, mind, and spirit. We do all this praying that your kingdom would come and your will would be done locally, but also globally and even cosmically. And so we bring all these prayers and all our praises to you to lay them before your throne of grace. All this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to then prepare our hearts and minds to open God's word by singing this song of preparation, a prayer of illumination. Show us Christ. I invite you to rise as able as we sing together.
I invite you to grab a Bible and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. The text, the reading, is not going to be on the screen today. I'd say oops, but I deleted the slides. I would really love today to see you grabbing a Bible and opening up to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. We're, in some sense, reading today about reading. We're learning about learning. We're hearing Jesus teaching about how he teaches us. In some ways, we're going to be reflecting on what it means to listen to scripture and sermon, even as we listen to scripture and sermon. And one of the ways we do that is by simply reading the text that is before us, seeing where it's located in the, the broader scope of the Bible, what lies around it in context, and then just hearing and attending to every word with hopefully every bit of our, every uh, aspect of our senses. So hear the word of the Lord from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large, large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying... A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The disciples came to him and asked, why, why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them this is why i speak to them in parables though seeing they do not see though hearing they do not hear or understand in them is fulfilled the prophecy of isaiah you will be ever hearing but never understanding you will be ever seeing but never perceiving for this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but... Since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus says in verse 9, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Seems like kind of a strange and redundant saying. You aren't going to hear him say that if you don't have ears to hear. What is it really all about? There's something of a paradox there that captures, in a way, this whole passage. Jesus gives this, uh, this parable about 
parables, this preaching and teaching about preaching and teaching, about um, receiving, about a message given and a message received. It's like talking about talking or trying to think about thinking. It sounds kind of odd in a way. It makes this parable kind of a, a meta parable, a parable about parables. It might sound odd, but it can be kind of a fruitful thing at times. Um, in 1940, Mortimer Adler wrote a, uh, what became a famous book called How to Read a Book. It seems kind of odd. What are you going to do if you pick up this book and don't know how to read a book? How are you going to benefit from it if you don't already know how to do it? And if you already know how to do it, then why bother with the book? Because you already know how to read a book. And yet it turns out that it's very possible to know how to read without really reading. You might learn in school how to read a, a word and a sentence and a paragraph and maybe even a page, but not really learn how to read a book. And he sets out to give you some guidance. And many people over the years have found this to be actually a quite helpful book about how to read a book. The hope and plan is, as I said, in the coming weeks to uh, go through many of Jesus' parables together. But at the beginning, it seemed good to start with this parable about um, learning. Jesus' teaching about teaching, his preaching about preaching, and how it is received. It is something of a meta parable, but in short order, in this passage, he gives us a number of things. He gives us the parable itself, preached to the crowd, and then, just with his disciples, he gives some kind of difficult to understand teaching about his teaching and why he teaches in parables, and then he comes around and gives them this very plain explanation of, of the parable again. So we read all three of those sections, and that's the point of our reflection today. So today's sermon is a bit like reading a book about reading a book. The sermon I'm giving to you is about listening to a sermon. We're trying to understand how to understand, how to, to learn how to be better learners gathered at the feet of Jesus. You get the idea, I hope. Or at least I hope you do. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. We'll start with the parable itself and the, the key features that started out, the sower and the seed. Matthew starts by telling us that Jesus is uh, seated, seated in a boat, gathered with people who are along the, uh, the shore of the lake, a kind of natural amphitheater, a place that is meant to sort of amplify hearing, and that seems significant. He says to them, listen, a farmer, or a, literally a sower, went out to sow his seed. The image Jesus is using is a common enough one throughout the world and throughout history, someone going out and sowing seed. But Jesus doesn't really say too much about this sower, just that the sower sows the seed. The NIV that we looked at translates it as farmer, and that's kind of true. I mean, we can see why. On the other hand, this particular sower doesn't seem to do some of the other things that a good farmer would do, like prepare the soil by removing rocks and pulling up thorns and weeds. There's no mention of watering this um, seed once it's sown or any number of things that a farmer might do. It's just the sower is the one who sows the seed. It doesn't say explicitly who the sower of the seed is, but um, in a second parable in this chapter, a little later, a very similar one that we'll, uh, Lord willing, look at in a couple of weeks, in verse 37 it says, the one who sowed the seed is the son of man. So that's probably here too. But Jesus doesn't identify it right away as the sower here or in the explanation in, the, in this chapter. And so maybe it's good to say that first the sower is representative of just someone who has a message to share. That much of what Jesus is describing in this parable is a pretty universal phenomenon of what human communication is like. Someone who has a message, an idea shares it out. And what happens to that message or idea as it, as it goes out? This is something about how human communication works more universally and then gets applied particularly to the message that Jesus is bringing. The sower sows a seed. What is a seed? When we know that a seed is, is very small, but even very small, a seed contains whole lot. I mean, even a, a physical seed, just on the level of a physical seed that we have, if we buy a, a pack of seeds for the garden in the spring, every one of those seeds has within it all the genetic material to become a grain of wheat or a mustard tree or a sunflower or an orange tree or a watermelon vine. All the information it needs is 
in that seed. A seed somehow knows how to, well, lie dormant in the soil through winter and then begin in the spring responding to the warmth and sunlight. How to send down little initial runners that become roots that connect to the soil. How to send up a sprout that becomes leaves and a bud and a flower and fruit. A seed knows how to do all these things. A seed is like this concentration of an immense amount of of information and meaning and potential transformation all in this one tiny thing. In verse 19, Jesus says in his explanation of the parable that the seed is the message of the kingdom. The message of the kingdom. So many of Jesus' parables are about the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. It's about the kingdom. The kingdom is this core, this very heart of the message that Jesus has come to proclaim and to embody in himself. It is the message he is calling his disciples to receive, but also then to go forward and and proclaim and embody to others. It is a great, powerful thing but it can be summarized in something so small. You could could boil the gospel down to saying, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But the gospel can be expanded up into volumes of stories and writings and thousands and thousands and tens of thousands that will be preached this very day, including hopefully this one. The gospel is the message of the kingdom. It is this seed that is being sown. A sower goes out to sow his seed. It's such a simple statement, but there's so much already just in that. But the parable itself doesn't really focus on the sower or the seed. It spends most of its time talking about the soil. Uh, Four different kinds of soils, to be specific. Four different ways of receiving a message. I think you can think of it, I think it sort of scales up. You can think of it Within yourself, you can think of it as four different ways in which I might respond to a message that comes to me. You might think of it as a certain kind of person, that a certain, each of us becomes a certain, is or becomes a certain kind of person that responds according to a way that corresponds to one of these soils. Or maybe you can scale it up even to the, to whole types of people or whole communities of people that tend to respond towards a message in a similar kind of way. It's about these different modes of reception or non-reception of a message. So let's go through them uh, one through four here a minute. The first one is, is the soil that is the path. Verse four says, as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. A path, of course, is, is dirt, it's soil, but it's, it's compacted. It's, it's hard, it's impenetrable. The seed can't get any purchase. It can't find a place to sink any little roots down into. It's a heart or a mind or a mode of reception that you might say is uh, calloused. Cynical, dismissive, it doesn't really receive what's given to it. Now, about some kinds of messages we receive, that might be a perfectly understandable and and right option, right? Like, we are bombarded with advertisements, for example. Every one of them has a message in it, something it wants us to receive, and generally an action it wants us to take, some service or product it wants us to buy. Much, much of the time, those things just bounce off us like hard paths. Our hearts are not open or receptive to them. We receive lots of messages from all over, and, and many sometimes we are that, that path. But Jesus applies it specifically in his explanation at verse 19. He says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. Note that this is someone who, he says, hears the message about the kingdom. This is not someone who refuses outright to listen. This is someone who listens. Actually, the the verb tense says that this is an ongoing thing. They're listening on a regular basis. This is someone, you'd say, who's coming to church to listen to sermons or sitting down regularly with the Bible and and reading it. But you know how you you can listen without really listening? You can read without really reading? Have you ever sat down with something to read, intending to read it, and And you sit down and your eyes after a while are scanning the words. Maybe you're even turning pages, but you find that 
10, 15, 20 minutes have gone by and I have no idea what I just read. My mind has been entirely engaged elsewhere. I'm either too tired or too distracted or whatever, but there's just no, there's no space in me to really receive what this piece of, this, what the message of this is. These are people who are hearing without really hearing. Jesus says they are not understanding, and uh, Dale Bruner, a commenter on this passage, says, in this sense, understanding is not merely about, like, literally, cognitively understanding each individual word, but grasping its message. It's more about standing under than maybe what we think usually when we say understanding. Standing under this and receiving it in a kind of trust and obedience. Taking it and, and receiving it. That's what is not happening for this half kind of soil. And when that happens, well, then the message is very quickly snatched away. It doesn't last long. The word we read in our morning devotions or in our Bible study with our friends is gone within 15 minutes when our mind goes to other things. The sermon that was preached lasts a shorter time than the very delicious cookies we eat after the service. It doesn't last until we pull out of the parking lot and we are, it is, might as well, it has gone effectively in one ear and out the other. It's been snatched away. So that's one mode of reception. And again, you can, you can think then about your own heart and mind or even moments and seasons of life when I have been like that. You can think of particular people, yourself or others, who tend to respond like that. Or you can think of whole communities where the message of the kingdom doesn't, really have a chance. It can't, can't really even get started. The next kind of soil that Jesus mentions is the, the rocky terrain. He says about this, this is at verse 5 and 6, he says, some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Here, the, the word, the message, the seed, actually gets a, a kind of beginning. It makes it further than it did with the path. It is able to get some little roots, and it's able to put up a little sprout. There is new life. There is new hope. But then, trouble comes. The roots don't go very deep. They're unable to find real nourishment or to find the water or nutrients they're going to need to live. In his explanation in verses 20 and 21, Jesus says, this is those who receive the message with joy. They love doing their devotions and Bible studies and listening to sermons. They love it. It's a delight. It's a joy. It's wonderful. It's engaging. It's entertaining. It's received with joy. But there's an initial enthusiasm that doesn't somehow last. It's like last year's fashion. It, it fades almost by design. And what causes it to fade especially are these rocks. Jesus calls them trouble and persecution. Pressure comes. Waves of doubt come. Struggle and suffering comes. Someone questions your faith. You endure some suffering. And without some deeper roots, that little plant of, of faith and life transformation just can't really last. I mean, it's a remarkable thing. Even a small plant, you've seen it sometimes, where a small plant that does have some roots can push up around and through rocks and even through asphalt, and it can, it can manage to grow. But if, if the roots aren't able to sink down, then that plant can be knocked over by a falling twig. It's about rootedness, the rocky terrain. In a kind of parallel fashion, the next one is about the thorns. Again, verse 7, Jesus says, Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Again, the message is heard. This is someone who is listening. And it does get some initial growth, like with the rocks. But this is not the only thing growing in this heart, in this mind, in this type of person. There are other things growing too, and Jesus identifies them in verse 22. He says, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. The worries of life. 
and the deceitfulness of wealth. Dale Bruner again, he says uh, that we- worries have a, way, have a way of depressing us and wealth has a way of impressing us. Depressed or impressed, these are the world's fears and the world's hopes, false fears and false hopes that can grow in a heart, in a mind, in a person, in a community, right along with the good word. You think of the Christian who, say, um, comes and, and listens to a sermon, and maybe even finds a little time for Bible reading, but then basically drowns it out with 15 or 20 or 30 hours or more each week of political talk radio. Like that, that little good seed just barely has a chance. I'm not talking about merely being informed of what's going on in the world. I'm talking about the kind of preoccupied worry. The ongoing fretting. The worries of this life. Or, or the deceitfulness of wealth. The person who, who hears the good news of the gospel but just can't stop checking in on their 401k and Roth IRA, which have a way of producing in us both the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth. And finding their real hope and security in the amount of money, the amount of digits in their column. This is a warning about distraction that can come in so many different forms. Distraction that can cause so many things to grow in our hearts and lives that choke out the fruitfulness of the word. Probably in the North American church, among North American Christians, this is the greater danger than the rocks. The trouble and persecution. Not that we don't endure some trouble and suffering and and, and occasionally forms of persecution, but boy, do we have more than our share of distracting prosperity. Rocks have a way of undermining roots, but thorns destroy fruit. They take away the fruitfulness. We carry with us in our pockets machines and devices that seem like, as the more longer we have them, it seems like their key purpose is to distract us. To be attention-grabbing and seeking devices that constantly are pulling away our attention. Whoever just dropped their phone, that was perfect timing. Thanks. That's what that was. But it seems more and more like that is what they are designed and intended to do, to, to hold our attention. And to give our attention, not just in the moment, although certainly that, but in an enduring way to let the the word and the message of the kingdom dwell in our hearts richly and establish roots and grow up means pulling some weeds and getting them out of the way and giving that message a real chance to to land and grow and flourish. And that brings us to the, the fourth soil, the good soil. Jesus says at verse 8, Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Jesus doesn't add much to this in the explanation. He simply says the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. Really, really receives it. This is a soil that in receiving the word yields a stalk and a head of grain and a crop, and additional seeds, and it has this multiplication factor kind of built in. A fruitfulness that lasts. Not all are equally fruitful. Jesus says 160 or 30 times. I suppose what grows in any one context depends on God, is, is really God's business. Some lives, some communities will be more fruitful than others, but all will bear some fruit. Fruit of the kingdom. Fruit of abundance. Life peace and holiness and growth and sinners coming to repentance. It's interesting when you step back from these four soils to say, you know, only one in four of the soils Jesus describes actually produces any fruit. It's not very good odds, one in four. But if I can flip metaphors uh, to a sports analogy, if, if a baseball player walks up to the plate and one time in four they get a hit, they're batting 250. You're probably not going to the all-star game with 250, but you're contributing. But then imagine that with that 250, your your, uh, slugging numbers are off the charts. I'm looking at Kevin because he's a baseball fan. Doubles and triples and home runs, uh, more than singles. 
You're contributing all the time for your team. 250, one out of four. There's only one soil that produces fruit, but it produces 30 and 60 and 100 times what was sown. A lot of fruitfulness, largely because of how good the seed is and the soil's capacity to receive and grow. In the middle, in between Jesus' parable and his explanation uh, of the parable comes his little description of why he teaches the way he does. And this bit of reflection on, on human understanding. It seems his parables have both a, an intention to reveal to us, but sometimes also to hide from us. Uh, sometimes the description of parables I've heard is that it gives an earthly meaning, uh, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? It's going to take something heavenly and spiritual and difficult and make it earthly and comprehensible to us and understandable. And I, I think that's true, but except for the fact that Jesus says sometimes parables are meant to hide as much as reveal. There's a sense in which there are depths to Jesus' parables and his teaching that you won't encounter, you won't understand it all right away the first time. It's going to take some time. There's a, a time-release character to some of Jesus' teachings. It might take multiple readings at different stages of life, maybe in different communities, and different eyes and ears to hear and draw out all that's intended. These are teachings of Jesus that we not only read, but in a way they read us. And in different moments and seasons of life, we encounter them. I mean, even in this parable today, I've returned to it I don't know how many times in life. But it keeps opening up new things, new meanings in the text, and also new things in me that I see need to be brought out. This is part of the, the beauty and power, as well as the puzzle and frustration of Jesus' teachings and parables, is that they can be sometimes tough nuts to crack. But as we puzzle over them and, and seek to crack them open, sometimes it's something in us that cracks open. And we find, as, as we, we sang and prayed before this, that, that what's being revealed to us isn't merely the meaning of a parable, but something about the secret and the heart of the kingdom. That tells us not only something about this parable, but about the parable teller. About the Jesus who is teaching us. So that as we read and preach and ponder and meditate God's word, we're fundamentally saying, show us Christ. What we want to see in all this is not merely something about uh, gardening or merely even about ourselves, but about Christ. And that as we read and listen and meditate and ponder, it's Christ we're coming to know more. I'm struck that this teaching of Jesus uh, lays an emphasis on the role of hearers and listeners and receivers. We place a fair amount of responsibility, and rightly so, on those of us who preach and teach or write in ways that people will read, and, and that's right, but, but Jesus places a good deal of responsibility at the laps of listeners, how we listen, how we receive. We're part of a church and a tradition that has a high view of preaching. We put the pulpit square in the middle of our worship space, and we put the we give the sermon a fair deal of time and space in our worship services. My title at the end of the day, uh, that I usually go by as pastor, but my official title is Minister of the Word. My chief calling is to administer God's Word to you. In this form and in other forms, sometimes in Bible studies, sometimes on a, at a hospital bed. To administer God's Word to you as a kind of medicine, a kind of food, that is a great responsibility, but do you see how no matter how well I or someone in, the, in my shoes does this work, it will lead to nothing if there's not a corresponding role and responsibility for listeners. Uh, the preacher George Whitefield once um, gave a sermon about how to listen to a sermon. I guess that's kind of what today's is. He was preaching on Luke chapter 8, verse 18, where Jesus says, Consider carefully how you listen. How you listen. And he gave some suggestions that I'm repackaging a little bit and summarizing for you here. But he says, when you listen to a sermon, first of all, come and listen out of a sincere desire to know and to do what God calls you to. Don't come to the sermon merely for curiosity and certainly not for entertainment. He says, listen to that sermon as if you are receiving an announcement on matters of life and death. 
matters of life and death, as if your very peace and happiness and your, the core of your relationship to Almighty God were at stake. He says, pay way more attention to the message than the messenger. Preachers are people like you. Don't worry too much about whether you like them or not. Don't even worry too much, he says, if you feel like their lives don't even match up to their own preaching, because none perfectly do. Don't worry about which preachers you personally prefer. Fourthly, he says, strive to apply everything you hear to your own heart. Every word of promise, every command, every conviction, every word of reassurance. Apply it to yourself three times for every time you apply it once to somebody else. Fifthly, he says, pray. Pray. Pray before a sermon. Pray during a sermon. Pray after a sermon. Pray for the preacher. Pray for the listeners. Pray that the word will be heard and received and understood and lived. I would add to that, ordinarily, listen with an open Bible. That's why I made you get a Bible out today. It's a really good habit to ordinarily listen with an open Bible. It allows you to verify that what's being said corresponds to what has been written and recorded. It gives you at least one time every week where you are flipping open a Bible and remembering where book and chapter and verse is found. And it's a sign, I will say, as a preacher, that you are, people with open Bibles before them look like they have open hearts. It looks like they have an intention to be good soil. Lastly, being good receivers of a message sermon, devotion, Bible study of the word of the kingdom necessarily translates into being fruitful and to being and becoming those who also spread and scatter the seed. There is multiplication built into Jesus' understanding of what the message of the kingdom is for. It is meant to grow and multiply and be shared and spread. Maybe in some ways we don't really understand it until we've tried to also spread it and share it to others. So to that end, let's go to God together in prayer, asking that we would receive well and scatter freely the gracious message he gives us this day. God, our Father, we pray today with thanksgiving for all that you have given in your word. It is really exactly what we need. It is all that we need. It is rich and fulfilling and has the great potential to transform our lives, to nourish and sustain us, to heal us, to cleanse us, to empower us to live lives shaped by the message and person of Jesus. Let all of us who have ears to hear really hear. And may our lives and our community be fruitful and a place where the seed and the message of the kingdom continues to be spread and grow and transform lives and transform your world. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When we sing after sermon, we are really seeking to give some, some words and some expression to how we hope this word lives and grows in us. And we'll do that today in this song, Your Labor is Not in Vain, that our lives might be fruitful for Christ and his kingdom. I invite you to rise as able as we sing together.
I'm going to invite you to be seated for a moment because I'm looking for Ung. Is he here? I thought I saw him come in and I have a note that he was coming. Um, maybe not. Okay, let me explain. Sorry for the confusion. Uh, next week, we're worshiping with the Christian Agape Church, and we were going to have a couple people come and teach us one of their songs a little bit here at the end of things today. And I thought Ung was going to do that for us, but now I don't see him. So what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up our worship service as originally planned, um, and, and maybe we'll see him afterwards and work it out. Maybe down in adult ed we can run through it a minute, or otherwise we'll just learn it next week when we gather for worship. So... I don't see him. So we're going to go ahead. So, sorry. Would you rise once again? Thanks for being good sports. I'm going to send you, uh, but as we send you, we send you with God's blessing. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you now and forevermore his abiding peace. Amen and amen. serve the Lord.